All right, so we are live. My name is Jesse, and I am the lead on the Conservation Stories Canada project. Or over 2021, I'll be heading out to every province and up to the territories to feature amazing stories of Canadian conservation in action. So over the course of this virtual interview series in the lead up to my travels, I've been covering stories coast to coast across the country. And today I'm throwing that all out the window to talk to a scientist whose work has taken her far away from Canada shores, but I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk to Dr. Emily Darling. She has gone all over this planet. She's been lauded by a huge amount of organizations. Her work's been featured on PBS, CNN, National Geographic, and more. Emily, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I really appreciate it. Hi, Jesse. It's such an honor, and I'm so glad our paths finally crossed, even in this virtual interweb space. And it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. So your work takes you scuba diving. You've explored coral reefs all over this planet. And so for people that might not know, this is increasingly becoming a news story as coral bleaching, but could you explain a little bit about what exactly that is? Sure. Um, well, you're absolutely right. Coral reefs are some of the most remarkable ecosystems on the planet. Uh, they're certainly the ones that have, you know, really breathed life into how I experience the world underwater. Um, these are remarkable systems, metropolises, you know, in our oceans of thousands of species of fish and corals, all sort of intertwined into a functioning system um, that is so important for hundreds of millions of people around the planet healthy coral reefs, um, so I will get to your bleaching question soon, um, but healthy coral reefs that are able to grow and reproduce and, and build um, can be natural seawalls that protect coastal communities from storms and sea level rise and tsunamis. Um, they host, you know, diverse and productive fisheries that provide food and livelihood for hundreds million peop of millions of people. And so we're, but we're worried about them. Um, you know, coral reefs have dying um, and in large part due to coral bleaching. So coral bleaching is related to climate change and the increasingly warm temperatures uh, of our oceans. Uh, as, as we all know, you know, our planet is changing um, because of increasing carbon emissions and the oceans actually absorb, you know, 98% of that heat. So that heat is really coming into the oceans, heating up the oceans. And for corals, that means that they're also experiencing much hotter summers, much hotter winters. And because corals are tropical animals, it means that they're, they're pretty good in hot weather <laughs> being in the belts of the equator around our planet but we're worried because they're already living at their threshold normally or naturally and so as climate change keeps building up the temperature in the ocean they just have they have no space to to tolerate that and so coral bleaching is a sign of that it's a stress response where um, the algae, these little cute symbiotic algae that live in the coral tissue, um, that relationship, which is so important for the coral, breaks down when it gets too hot. And so that algae, which is very colorful, leaves the coral. The coral is then bleached or white. And basically, that's a sign that the coral is starving to death because it doesn't have um, this energy from the algae anymore. And so... Um, when warm waters rise uh, during El Ninos or other, you know, climatic events, this can cause mass coral bleaching, where, as we've seen, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia has bleached three times in a row. And that was something that's just never been recorded, um, you know, from scientific records or even from indigenous cultures and, and oral history um, in parts of Australia. This has just never been seen before. So a lot of my work has been trying to understand how can we bring together their surveys, not only of coral reef health, but also of these devastating bleaching events to try to understand um, what are the future trajectories for coral reefs and what can we do as conservation scientists, as applied ecologists, to really put our, our science where our mouth is. And uh, maybe that's not the right an analogy, but, you know, put our science where our mouth is to really Im Im improve and impact society. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful and definitely a unique analogy in the history of this program. So thank you for that. Um, so coral bleaching, I mean, it, it's an issue. We're, we're facing, you know, not just bleaching, they're facing so many threats. We're, we're losing coral reefs around the planet. If you're in Canada, if you're in Saskatchewan, why does this matter to you? I mean, other than the, the knowledge that we're losing this diversity, <laughs> we're losing this beauty, why should we care, really? I mean, I think we know why we care, but for someone who's never heard of this before as an issue, what's the interest? 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a really important question. And I think there's a couple different ways to approach that. Um, one is that, you know, coral reefs and healthy oceans are incredibly important to us as humanity. So every second breath we take comes from the oceans and that comes from tiny plants, which turn the energy from the sun into the oxygen we breathe. So having health oceans and coral reefs are an important, very important part of that uh, is important to having a functioning planet that continues to provide us um, with things that we use every day right now, in fact, like oxygen. You know, but I think more broadly, as, as a Canadian, I think as Canadians, we really care about the rest of the planet. And I think that's part of our, our values of who we are, you know, from Lester B. Pearson setting up the UN peacekeeping organization, um, you know, from the Red Cross who provide clean water and humanitarian response to people around the world from facing, you know, conflict zones or disasters. I think Canadians, we, we really care about the rest of the world. Um, and I think part of that comes from the, the types of opportunities and nature that we have here in our country. So I live here in Toronto on the Great Lakes, which is one of the world's largest sources of fresh water. Um, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate to go backpacking in the clean mountain air of the Rockies or to visit, um, you know, friends and colleagues in the Canadian high Arctic. So I think we really value nature as Canadians and value that intertwined, you know, intertwined connection between people and nature. Um, and so that, you know, doesn't just extend to the ecos the amazing ecosystems um, that are within the borders of our country, but I think we also know that that connection extends across our planet. And, you know, it's funny, I was, I was thinking about this a little bit, the Canadian Arctic and coral reefs actually have a little more in common than we might think. And one of those reasons is that they're both the front lines of climate change. So both these ecosystems are warming at a much greater rate than other places around the planet. And we're seeing ecosystems start to cross tipping points where consequences start to cascade. Um, so whether that's, you know, the loss of sea ice in the Arctic, which is threatening polar bears and walruses, or whether on coral reefs, that's the death of corals, where the ecosystems crumble and you no longer have that shoreline protection, you no longer have those fisheries. Um, so the more we can understand um, the impacts that we are having on our planet, from places like high Arctic to coral reefs, the more we can start to, to think about doing something about it. We're well, not even think about doing something about it, the more we need to do something about it. Um, and uh, so I think there's a lot, we as Canadians, the ecosystems we care about in our country, we can learn from other places around the world like coral reefs. Um, but also I think, you know, as part of, as part of being Canadian to care about other people, to care about um, other places on the planet. And I guess one more, one more response answer to that, um, which, you know, is I live in Toronto, which is one of the world's multicultural cities. And, you know, I read a recent statistic that more than half of the people who live in Toronto came from different, came from another country other than Canada. Um, and so Canadians, I think we also have this multicultural um, value, you know, also woven through us. And so it's very natural for us to care about other countries. Um, we're a very multicultural, diverse society. That is a beautiful and thoughtful answer and makes me feel more patriotic than ever. So uh, thank you for that, Emily. <laughs> uh, you talked at the end of that about implementing solutions. And so this is where my knowledge ends and yours takes off is how do you implement solutions? If you're losing coral reefs, I mean, climate change is such a big issue. It's something that we can all take part in doing, but concrete action on the ground. If you're in Indonesia and you're trying to protect a reef, what can you specifically do? What does that actually look like um, in the locations that you've had the, the luxury of visiting? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, you know, there's two really important things we need to tackle to save coral reefs. The first is obviously getting a hold on climate change. We need to reduce carbon emissions. We need to decarbonize our societies. We need to really take on renewable energy, wind, solar, better approaches that are more sustainable for our societies and our planet on board. That is one of the most important things to save coral reefs uh, you know, globally by bringing temperatures down below those thresholds that corals can tolerate and survive. So basically avoiding that coral bleaching we've been talking about. Um, but as you say, there's still very important actions we can take on the ground. So one of the most important things about climate change and bleaching for reefs is that it's not a blanket effect on the planet. It's variable. There's variation. And so, you know, unfortunately, that means there's going to be some reefs that are hit 
more, uh, you know, more than average. Um, but there's also, you know, the flip side of that is that there's reefs that are escaping coral bleaching. So we talk about those as climate refuges, similar to the, you know, glacial refuges um, that we've learned about during the ice ages, you know, in, in school. Um, but we're seeing that today for coral reefs. So there are pockets of reef around the planet um, that are doing better than expected. And those are some of the reefs I've had the privilege of diving on and surveying and, and working with local communities on how they're going to protect those reefs. So by identifying climate refuges or functioning coral reefs um, that still you know, have a lot of biodiversity, that have those ecosystem services and functions um, that, that communities want, um, that's where we really need to tackle local threats. So in places where destructive overfishing, like through bombs or poison or overfishing can tip an ecosystem into an unbalanced state, um, sustainable fisheries management is a really important action um, that can achieve not only biodiversity goals, but also, you know, allow people living um, living on the coast, access to uh, better quality fish, more better prices for their fish. So you can really achieve social, economic, and ecological goals if you have, you know, appropriate fisheries management. Um, another really good example of a local threat to tackle be um, water pollution. So corals are very sensitive, not only to temperature, but also to kind of anything else going on in the ecosystem they don't like. Um, that includes having too many nutrients or too many sediments coming from land-based, you know, agriculture or logging. So coral reefs live on the coastal margins, which means they live right next to land. And so any, you know, um, pollution that's running off from land can then smother a reef. And so one of, you know, the important local, uh, local conservation and management actions that is happening in around the world, but, you know, particularly in some of the places I work, like Fiji and the Solomon Islands, is to really have best practices in logging or agriculture on land so that there's clean water um, coming onto your reefs. And that can allow your reefs to, to reproduce, to grow, recover from events that are unpredictable, like cyclones or, or obviously the increasing, you know, frequency of coral bleaching. Um, so cleaning up water, doing better practices on land, having more sustainable fisheries, um, you know, those are some of the, the key uh, actions we can take. And those actions are actually really important because they've been identified through a recent global analysis we've just completed as tackling the top threats to coral reefs. So the top threats to coral, top local threats to coral reefs globally are fishing and water pollution. And so by taking those actions I talked about, I can help mitigate local threats. And that's obviously, incre you know, very important within these areas of climate refuges. If you have a functioning reef in a place that is escaping this coral bleaching, um, that's not where you want to, you know, have dynamite fishing, or that's not where you want to have, um, you know, a lot of sediment coming up from a logging operation. Those are reefs that are really going to be important uh, and an important blueprint as coral reefs recover, you know, as, as soon as we get this climate change thing under control. Well, that is a very, very hopeful message. And I'm, I'm so glad they're implementing those sort of best practices and doing some really concrete and, and fantastic work around the world and that there's a framework in place to make sure that this happens, you know, everywhere across the planet. Uh, this is very, very cool. I, I want to wrap up with one last question. I mean, we sort of instinctually know coral reefs are very cool. I think a lot of people recognize how beautiful and wonderful they are. I have to ask a personal and specific question for you. Have you ever seen spawning of coral reefs in person? Any spawning ever? This is my favorite <laughs> Oh, no, that's a tricky question. So I'm more of like a morning person and spawning happens in the middle. Of the day. Uh, so, so fortunately, no. Um, but, you know, I certainly have seen a lot of remarkable things um, on coral reefs. Um, you know, I think one of the dives that sticks with me the most um, now that it's a pandemic and I think a lot about diving um, was at the end of a three week surf trip in Fiji. Um, two years ago, and we'd been living with communities on Ova Island, learning about how they traditionally managed their fishery, um, how they would close their fishery to rebuild fish. So that would be like a 
ank for the community that they could eat the fish if there was a, a tr if there was a disaster. Um, a cyclone came through, so they opened their fishery to be able to feed everyone. Now they're closed again to prepare in case another disaster comes along. Um, so it was this very hopeful message, and you know we were doing some surveys right near a river mouth, and so that's where you you naturally get a lot of sediment coming onto the reefs. Um, and those usually aren't the best dive sites. Like those are not the ones in National Geographic. Um, so, you know, you can kind of barely see the end of your hand. It's brown, it's kind of gray. The light is filtering through the sediment. Um, the corals sort of look a bit sad and murky and you're kind of like, man, like so much long this dive I have to do. Um, and then, you know, there's this little glimmer of a gold sequined blue damselfish just out of the corner of my eye. And I'd finished my transects and my, you know, my science by then. I had some time to kill. So I, I swam over and I just ended up being transfixed by this little gold sequined blue damselfish just doing, you know, doing his job, going about his daily life, which for a damselfish on a coral reef means um, farming a lot of algae. They have their own garden. And so be clipping the, the turf algae with his teeth, um, kind of like um, mowing your lawn so that it grows back more productive so that he can eat more algae later. But he was just, you know, motoring along, doing his business. I came right in close and he kind of came, you know, zoomed right up to my goggles and started kind of, you know, tapped on the lens and was like, okay, you're in my space and like went back to his work. And I just realized, you know, this, this reef that he's on isn't the best reef in the world. But, you know, that didn't, that didn't stop him from, you know, being very industrious about making his own little patch of garden. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping, you know, have his own spawning event and have his own, you know, have their own babies and, uh, you know, to, to carry on the, those reefs and, and that damselfish into future generations. So, you know, I, I think about that, that a lot. Um, we, you know, our world is changing. Um, and there are lots of different ways that, you know, very hopefully we're going to mitigate and adapt to that. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of suffering. And um, that damselfish gives me a lot of hope that he, you know, he is still going about his daily business on a reef. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, you know, we've all got to get up in the morning and, and do the same and try to keep going. Emily, that was the perfect message to end on. I think if everyone had the same reverence for nature that you do, we'd be in a lot better situation. And I think that a lot more people, certainly youth these days, are, are really getting that sort of that sense of wonder and magic about the natural world. So thank you so much for sitting down with me today and sharing your story. Um, and I'm really excited to, to get it up and share it with more people soon. So really appreciate this.